Good afternoon, and welcome to today's high-level event on human security. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I have the great honor to introduce Secretary General Ban Ki-moon. The Secretary General will open today's event and is accompanied by Mrs. Ogata and Dr. Pitsuwan. Thank you, uh, Mrs. Saja uh, Rogers, for introduction. Uh, Madam Sadako Ogata, co-chair of the Commission on Human Security. Madam Sonia Picado, a chair of the Advisory Board on Human Security. And Mr. Surin Pitswan, member of the Commission on Human Security. Uh, distinguished ministers, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this high-level event on human security. I thank you all for your participation. Let me extend a warm welcome back to our former UN High Commissioner for Refugees, Madame Ogata. She left a valuable legacy here at the United Nations and has continued to advance our goals ever since. It is also good to see Mr. Pitson, former Secretary General of the ASEAN, with whom I had, I had the pleasure of working together very closely, we value his contribution to promotion, promoting ASEAN-UN cooperation. And we also warmly welcome uh, Madame Picado and thank you for your many contributions uh, to promoting United Nations values around the world. I again thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, we meet at a time of great turmoil and transition. The global economy is in crisis. The environment is under threat. Too many people around the world live in uncertainty. All the conflicts simmer, new conflicts explode, warring parties target civilians, violence is a problem even in peaceful countries. Women and girls are especially at risk. These are serious problems, but there are signs of progress. I welcome growing calls by citizens around the world, especially young people, for justice, dignity, and true democracy. These voices give us hope that we can transform our challenges into prospects for a better future. We have learned two lessons from the dramatic events of recent years. First, it is more important than ever to find comprehensive solutions to the world's interlinked problems. You cannot end the poverty without empowering women and girls. You cannot establish a lasting peace without respect for human rights. You cannot increase prosperity or address climate change without transforming the world's energy systems. We have to advance on all fronts. Second, our comprehensive approach must also be broad-based. We need traditional partners like governments and non-governmental organizations, but we also need academics, businesses, philanthropists, and others to help end poverty, promote development, and establish peace. The human security approach can help frame our efforts. I welcome the General Assembly's adoption of a human security uh, <coughs> adoption of its first ever resolution on a common understanding on human security last September. I commend the leadership of co-facilitators Jordan and Japan. This consensus builds on more than a decade of successful projects backed by the UN Trust Fund for Human Security. I thank the Government of Japan for its generous and steadfast support to the Trust Fund, as well as Slovenia, Thailand, Mexico, Greece, and other countries which contribute. I invite other donors to join them. I also appreciate the steadfast support of a group of countries
belonging to the human security network, currently chaired by Chile. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, the human security approach recognizes the links between peace development and human rights. The funds the projects have enabled communities around the world to make the transition towards peace and sustainable development. They have succeeded because they focus on people's needs. They draw on experts from different disciplines and different agencies. They transcend what we might think of as a traditional humanitarian or development work. The goal is always to empower people, bring different actors together, and generate holistic responses to complex challenges. We are now working to accelerate progress on the Millennium Development Goals while preparing a post-2015 development agenda. In all these efforts, we must consider human security as a central factor. The new General Assembly resolution provides the basis for adopting a human security approach across the United Nations system. I count on your ideas, your wisdom, and your energy to carry this forward. I thank you very much. Thank you very much. Secretary General, His Excellency Ban Ki-moon, Excellencies, Ministers, Ladies and Gentlemen, it is my great pleasure to give a statement at this high-level event on human security at the United Nations. First of all, I would like to extend my sincere appreciation to the Secretary General, the Security Unit, unit, unit of the Office of the Coordination and Humanitarian Affairs for organizing this event. The General Assembly Resolution on Human Security adopted in September 2012 was clearly a significant milestone. To me, as one who desperately needed a concept that provides protection for people suffering from a wide range of insecurities in the 1990s, and as one who has subsequently dedicated herself to developing and disseminating this concept, the adoption of the resolution was indeed an exciting event. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, please allow me to take this opportunity to share my own experiences that led to the birth of the human security concept. In the decade following the end of the Cold War, when I assumed the post of the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, the nature of conflicts had changed mostly from interstate to intrastate, and the sources of insecurity had become largely internal with ethnic, religious, and political groups fighting over contested rights and resources. I was faced with the daily operational challenges of coping with the protection and resettlement of the millions of people forced to leave their homes. While many had to cross international borders and become refugees eligible for international protection, many more became internally displaced without protection from any state. In carrying out my responsibilities, I repeatedly questioned how we should address the evolving issues and problems. I began to focus more and more directly on the victims, all affected people suffering within their own states. I learned that by focusing more directly on the people, we could find ways to provide protection for them, identify their needs, and uncover the social, economic, and political factors that endanger their own security. Thus, the concept of human security began to impress me more and more as a useful entry point to deal with the prevailing security issues all over the world. Internationally, too, the concept started to gain prominence. 
observing that the Asian financial crisis in 1997-98 had its heaviest impact on the socially vulnerable segments of the population, the late Japan's Prime Minister Keizo Obuchi announced his commitment to promote human security, which led to two major initiatives by the government of Japan. One is establishment of the UN Trust Fund for Human Security. And the other is to set up the Commission on Human Security with the support of the United Nations Secretary General. I had the privilege to co-chair the Commission with the respected economist and Nobel Prize laureate, Amatya Sen. After two years of research, field visits, and public hearings, the Commission released a report in 2003 entitled, Human Security Now. This report proposed an innovative framework of action that addresses critical threats to human security. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I think it is safe to say that the concept of human security has now evolved to a powerful tool for protecting and empowering people. Through applying this concept, the international community has come to recognize that the survival, livelihood, and dignity of people serve as the basis for achieving peace, development, and human progress. The concept can recognize the complexity, interrelatedness of insecurities facing people and the importance of working across broad spectrum of sectors to address the full range of insecurities. Moreover, the empowerment of vulnerable people for enabling them to take active roles in making their lives and communities more secure has been widely accepted as a central focus of development and humanitarian efforts. In order to translate the concept of human security into concrete activities, UN agencies have implemented some 200 projects in 85 countries with financial support from the UN Trust Fund for Human Security. Through this experience, we have learned a lot of valuable lessons about rebuilding war-torn communities, strengthening the resilience of vulnerable people exposed to sudden economic downturns and natural disasters, and addressing urban violence. Quite a number of good practices exist, as the Secretary General mentioned in his opening remarks. Other international partners have also come to increasingly apply the concept of human security in their operations. For example, the Japan International Cooperation Agency, which I headed for eight and a half years until March 2012, adopted human, secu adopted human security as a policy pillar and has accumulated experience with the application of the concept. In addition, I am pleased to note that the academic community has also taken strong interest in exploring the structural context of human security. The Japan Association of International Relations will host a session on human security this fall. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, since the birth of the concept, the international community has made significant advancement toward realizing human security. We have seen more seamless interventions among various actors, humanitarian and developmental, for protecting and empowering vulnerable people. Yet, there is no denying that in too many parts of the world, people are still left at the mercy of threats to their survival, lives, and dignity. At the same time, advancement in transportation and communication technologies have stimulated the aspiration of people and accelerated the movement of population and financial capital, further complicating the growing risks and threats to people's lives. Against this background, the adoption of the General Assembly Resolution on Human Security bears a tremendous impact. We have produced a powerful operational tool to address problems 
and provide solutions through concrete action. Those challenges and actions to be taken are enormous. Instead of discussion on the abstract, the UN enabled the Commission to initiate concrete means of addressing the challenge. First, the intervention by the UN Trust Fund for Human Security introduces concrete entry points for action. The projects supported by the Trust Fund have clearly made a difference <coughs> and demonstrated that there are now new, more holistic ways of identifying and addressing protection needs. But Identifying and tackling the root causes of insecurity require longer-term monitoring, innovative thinking, and collaborative and sustained effort. To fulfill these requirements, I would like to emphasize the need to enhance the involvement of member states in the operation of the Trust Fund and to expand the administrative and analytical capacity of the Human Security Unit. Secondly, now that a common understanding on human security has been established by the General Assembly Resolution adopted last September, the UN organizations and other development and humanitarian organizations should better integrate the concept and lessons learned into their own operations. This is particularly important given the limited size of each project through the Trust Fund. And I would also like to stress that human security should be an overarching principle for the post-2015 development agenda in order to coordinate and indeed galvanize the world's many humanitarian and development resources for greater effect. Finally, but not least importantly, there is one crucial issue that must be addressed, which is how to sustain the political will of governments and leaders to care and act on behalf of those who suffer. I would like to conclude my statement by asking the following questions. Do we show sufficient compassion for the people whose lives and dignity are at risk? If yes, how can we turn this compassion into political and benevolent action across the international community? Thank you very much. Thank you, Mrs. Agata. Dr. Pitswan, if you'd please. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Secretary General Ban Ki-moon of the United Nations, Madam Sadako Okata, co-chair of the Commission on Human Security, former UN High Commissioner for Refugees, Madam Sonia Picado, chairperson of the advisory board for the UN Human Security Trust Fund, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat> it is a great honor and a personal privilege for me to share some thoughts with you at the high-level event on human security here at the headquarters of the United Nations. Indeed, as the, as the Secretary General said, we have come a long way since the inception of the concept of human security here within the framework of the United Nations back in 1994. Professor Mahbub al haq at the UNDP was first to conceptualize the integrated mission of the UN as helping the people of the world to enjoy freedom from fear and freedom from want. It sounded noble and innocent enough when considered within the confines of academic exercise. And it more than made sense to encapsulate the diverse efforts of the UN family as the deliverance of people from the yoke of poverty and the tyranny of violence. But in international diplomacy, catchy phrases and goodwill are not adequate to allay suspicion and to gain consensus among governments and state institutions that the human security concept is not going to affect the state sovereignty, sacred to 
and coveted by all governments, big and small. That was and that remains true today. That is why it is so important to recognize the contribution of the UN Commission on Human Security, co-chaired by two mavericks, Madame Sadako Okata, who brought with her a perspective of protection of people in vulnerable situation, and Professor Amatia Sen, a Nobel laureate whose lifelong work has been focusing on the fulfillment of human potentiality. The findings of the Commission's report, Human Security Now, back in 2003, carefully negotiated the hesitation the suspicion among some member states and deliver a clear definition that is reflected in the words of the General Assembly's Resolution 66-290, adopted on the 10th of September 2012. And I quote, Human security does not entail the threat or the use of force or coercive measures. Human security does not replace state security. Moreover, human security is based on national ownership. And governments retain the primary role and responsibility for ensuring the survival, the livelihood, and the dignity of their citizens." Unquote. And the generosity of the Japanese government has made it possible for all of us to test these definitions and parameters of human security. Thanks to the UN Trust Fund for Human Security, we have been able to demonstrate that the implementation of and the integration of human security concept into the works of the United Nations agencies and international organizations, official or non-official, has not infringed upon state sovereignty or state power. On the contrary, human security approach has helped fine-tune and sensitize development assistance, humanitarian efforts, and international cooperation to secure better results for the vulnerable people exposed to pervasive threats. Whether it is a joint project between WHO, UNICEF, an international migration organization, IMO, to deliver health care to the migrant workers in Thailand, or the efforts to protect victims of human trafficking in Central Asia, or the development of water resources in Africa. Human security approach adds meaning and inclusivity and a sense of focus on the human persons. It truly humanizes the traditional concept of security, while it does not subtract from the security of the state, it shifts the focus slightly to put the spotlight on the human vulnerability and sufferings. Equipped with such a powerful resolution, it is my fervent hope, Mr. Secretary-General, Excellencies, that we here at the UN can now streamline the concept of human security more effectively and seamlessly into everything we do in the name of development, development assistance, and international cooperation. Your presence here today, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, gives me a strong encouragement that the concept of human security shall, from now on, be viewed as a value-added and a rational approach in the dip diplomatic discourse of the international community. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Pitsawan. The opening segment has now come to a close, and I would like to thank the Secretary General, Mrs. Ogata and Dr. Pitsawan for their remarks. And we would kindly ask for the meeting to pause as they leave the, their seats. <laughs>
received, ladies and gentlemen, the advancement of human security owes a great deal to the commitment and guidance of the Advisory Board on Human Security. I would like to welcome our next speaker to the podium, Ms. Sonia Picado, the Chair of the Advisory Board. Thank you. Thank you, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, amigas, amigos todos. Today, I would like to share the perspective of the Advisory Board on Human Security, which I currently chair. But first, I would like to recognize those members of the original Human Commission, Mrs. Ogata, Surin Pichuan, and Ambassador Carl Town. I really appreciate your being here today with us. And also, I would like to acknowledge the other members of the Advisory Board who are here with us today. It was the Commission, in fact, who recommended that the Advisory Board be formed in 2003. We were charged with two main tasks, to advise the Secretary General on the general guidelines of the UN Trust Fund for Human Security, and to deepen the understanding and acceptance of human security worldwide. We now carry out that mission working closely with the Human Security Unit, which has done a great job for this meeting. The chief of aim of the United Nations Trust Fund has been applied to the concept of human security through the project that it supports. Over the years, the fund and its partners have honed an approach that has brought new energy and ideas to tackling very difficult issues. Based on the lessons that we have learned, we have revised the founding guidelines no less than seven times. I think that's good news for all of you. Uh, this rapid learning process reflects the experience of dozens of partners in the United Nations agencies, government at all levels, civil society, including the community members themselves. It reflects input from some 200 projects in more than 85 countries in Africa, Eastern Europe, Central Africa, Asia, the Pacific region, Latin America and the Caribbean, and the Middle East and Arab states. And what it means is that each successive set of projects has been able to benefit from what has been learned in the previous ones. Keen to share these lessons more broadly, the Advisory Board has worked with our colleagues at the Human Security Unit to develop a number of products and tools. The Human Security Handbook outlines the principles, tools, and activities for those who seek to apply the human security approach. Six regional workshops of the United Nations organizations applying the four funds, as well as other interested partners, have also played a big role in sharing best practices. Other products include Human Security Newsletter, sent to more than 10,000 practitioners, and the website featuring project summaries, testimonials from beneficiaries, photos, and videos. Most recently, a new brochure outlines how the human security approach has been successfully applied, not only in cases of post-conflict and peace building, but in alleviating threats of poverty by climate change, migration, urban violence, and poor health. It gives examples of how projects have applied the protection and empowerment framework and other elements of human security to address multidimensional problems. It is clear that the human security approach adds great value, and I encourage you to take a look at this and all of its products. These methodological tools have been and continue to be pivotal in mainstreaming the principles of human security, both within and outside the United Nations. We have come a long way and much has been achieved, but we also have a long way to go. For far too many people around the world, insecurity is a daily reality. Speaking on behalf of my fellow advisory board members, we are energized by the resolution of the General Assembly last September that affirmed a shared understanding of human security. And we are encouraged by the growing interest in human security by those outside the United Nations. We envision, as the Commission of Human Security did, a truly global initiative to bring human security to all. We ask for your help, your ideas, and your active partnership. Thank you very much. Gracias.
Okay. Thank you, Ms. Picado, for your remarks and to the board for their invaluable support over the past 10 years. As part of today's program, the Human Security Unit has produced a short video on the concept of human security and the work of the United Nations Trust Fund for Human Security. The purpose of the video? To provide a clear understanding of the human security approach and how it can be of value to future, to, excuse me, to current and future challenges. Without further ado, the video. Interpretation disclaimer, we will not be able to interpret the video since we do not have a direct sound feed in the booths. Thank you for your understanding. Not only have the number of threats multiplied, but because of our interconnected world, they spread faster and wider than ever before. Together, they threaten the core of our human security. But these threats cannot be seen or solved in isolation. We need to work together to overcome these threats. The human security approach offers a complete response to these complex threats. It protects and empowers vulnerable communities. It addresses the full range of threats faced by communities at risk. As a result, it brings meaningful change to people's lives. That's why human security programs are designed through partnerships. And together, we create an environment where people can live their lives free from want, free from fear, free to live in dignity. The beauty and uniqueness of the Northern Igali Outer Recovery Program was that we had different UN agencies doing different but complementary activities. People are very busy in their gardens, planting crops, health facilities, wood roads, you know, people can access easily the school. You see children happily going to school. We are targeting resettling people who were previously affected by the Elara war. Uh, those infrastructure activities were reinforced by environmental activities. That again was reinforced by health care related activities under World Health. This is part of the infrastructure that WSP is trying to develop for the returnees under the UN Trust Fund uh, project. The store is supposed to help them uh, do collective marketing. When they bulk and sell us at a later time, they're able to fetch higher prices than when they sell during the harvest uh, season. Villain serving, a villain no coin at the toilet on a retiani and a copy put at the year. And no can a coin, maybe you cap her on a more tier. If I'm genuinely one of you getting here, I don't know a cat at your ball. If you talk and it was cool, you know. Having worked on this very project, and specifically through the UN Trust Fund for Human Security projects that involve bringing together a number of UN agencies and also the government staff, and where we really touched the lives of the people. Seeing people move and drive on this road and the children walk to school makes you feel proud. 
because you've really touched the lives of the people, uh, not for now, even for many years to come. United Nations and the international community. Ambassador Octavio Erosudez, the permanent representative of Chile to the United Nations, will chair the next segment of today's event. Please welcome Ambassador Erosudez and our distinguished panelists. Thank you very much. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Mrs. Agata, Mrs. Picado, Minister Pizzuwan, thank you very much for being with us today. For me, para mí como embajador de Chile, for me as the ambassador of Chile, and as the chair of the Human Security Network. I am very pleased to be moderating this panel 
including such distinguished and select panelists on the implementation of human or rather the application of human security. Every day that we come to the United Nations and uh, in one way or another we pass a monument which honors uh, the memory of Ralph Johnson Bunch, uh, Undersecretary of the United Nations for Political Affairs and a Nobel Prize winner for 1950. And on this monument, there is a sentence I would like to quote. It reads as follows. To have a meaning for many who have known only suffering both peace and war must be translated into bread and rice, shelter, health and education, as well as freedom and human dignity. Fin de cita. End quote. I think that this sentence encloses the very essence of what human security is and proposes to be. For this reason, I th and uh, for a very good reason, I think we can all be motivated by the recent approval by consensus of Resolution six, uh, 66290, which was uh, described as a milestone in uh, the future of human security by Mrs. Sogata. This includes the recently mentioned uh, events at the same time as it recognizes the links between peace, development, and human rights as well as the equal interest that all fundamental rights and liberties deserve. As the Secretary General says, we have been moving down this integrated path for quite some time. On this basis and with this consensus, we now need to increase our efforts to enhance human security given due consideration to the examples and best practices we can derive from the operations of the United Nations Trust Fund for Human Security. We must promote the cross-cutting nature of this focus throughout the United Nations system, recognizing the ownership of states themselves and communities and individuals when it comes to the task of having a beneficial impact on the lives of so many millions of people in today's world who are not yet free from fear and need. Without further ado, I would like to introduce our first panel member. the Undersecretary General for Human Security and advisor to the Secretary General on that uh, subject, Mr. Yukio Takasu, who you may recall uh, is also remembered as a permanent representative of Japan to this body and one of the advocates of human security. You have the floor, sir. Ambassador Octavio, good friends, uh, excellencies and distinguished uh, uh, guests. Um, the, it's a personally great pleasure for me uh, since uh, this uh, milestone uh, adoption of uh, resolution by General Assembly on common understanding on human security last fall. Uh, many of, of uh, speakers agreed that it's a historic importance. But uh, for me, uh, it's uh, the personal gratification since uh, I participated in every step uh, during this uh, very painstaking uh, consensus building process uh, since 1999 when this uh, trust fund of human security was created. Since then, I'm personally involved every step. So I'm very, very grateful to uh, the two ambassadors, uh, Jordan and Japan, who worked uh, very hard for this uh, consensus resolution. And also Ambassador Chile and Honduras, many others, who were in Austria and many other people sitting here, a member of Human Security Network, they made a very, very important contribution, and I'm personally very grateful to that. 
Um, the, we have, uh, I think, come a long way. This consensus adoption of Resolution GA underscores the importance of notion of human security. Because nowadays, as the slide says, many people said, security threat to every individual is very cross-cutting, very multidimensional. So no single perspective, no single intervention will find fundamental sustainable solution. So securing life, livelihood, dignity of every individual on this globe, so long as that person is a human being, human security approach is absolutely essential. And also consensus adoption is very important because it highlights commitment for member states to apply and mainstream human security concept within UN and obviously great world beyond the UN as well. Uh, Mr. Chairman, um, paragraph 8 of resolution 66290, there is a paragraph requesting member state secretary general to submit a report on the implementation of resolution to the next session of General Assembly this autumn. Specifically, resolution asked secretary general that the next report is different from previous report because now we have a common understanding. So stages, implementation, application. How this concept is applied? What is experiences? And what are the lessons in applying this concept? International level, national level, regional level, even local level. To this purpose, in my personal capacity as a special advisor to Secretary General in Human Security, I sent a survey on human security issues in January, this January, to all member states and many other stakeholders, not necessarily limited to the government. And by this time, I'm pleased to inform you, total of 136 responses were received by UN Secretariat. From member states, UN country team, UN agencies, funds and program, and many UN Secretariat departments, regional intergovernmental organizations, and many NGOs, also academia, responded. This uh, yielded very valuable information on human security related activities that has been implemented throughout the world. This also evidence that human security approach has influenced policies and programs of not only UN programs, but also many governments. But at the same time, survey came up some kind of issues, challenges, difficulties. I'd like to share with you briefly on a few preliminary observations on the basis of survey which will be probably the main body of the forthcoming Secretary General's report. First, which area of UN activities can be benefited by human security approach? Resolution 66-290 has clarified that human security approach provides lens by which we can better see, address global challenges through actions that are people-centered, always focus on people's perspective and also inclusive and equitable, proactive and preventive, comprehensive and integrated, collective and sustainable. From the survey, it's clear that such approach is relevant in providing concrete solutions in a wide range of UN activities, such people trapped in conflict, actions in support of post-conflict peace building, sustainability responses to climate-related challenges in addressing situation of multiple insecurities facing isolated communities, internally displaced people, refugees, victims of human trafficking, etc. In particular, it's important to emphasize that many respondents highlight human security approach can be instrumental to acceleration of MDG implementation with now less than 1,000 days in the post-2015 development agenda. Human security approach focuses on individuals, not on aggregate of group of people, or average of nation or world. Thus, it identified the different vulnerability among group of people, or a geographical area within a country. And it mobilizes collective action across sectors among governments international community and private sector in civil society. For instance, accelerating MDG by end of 2015 is a priority of many countries. 
I give example in Ghana. In spite of progress in overall MDG implementation, MDG 4 and 5, child mortality and maternal health, are particularly lagging behind. Due to significant geographical disparities among 10 uh, regions in, inside of Ghana, Ministry of Health and the country team, UN country team, developed jointly MDG acceleration framework for maternal health to reduce maternal mortality by focusing on address inequity in per capita distribution of health facilities and health workers across the regions and the district. It's also recognized maternal mortality cannot be reduced in isolation with healthy livelihood, such as food and nutrition, clean water, reduction of poverty, gender issue, and illiteracy. This is a very good example of applying people-centered, inclusive, equitable, integrated approach called human security approach on the ground. As both Secretary General and Madam Ogata stated in the opening remarks, such perspective should be at the center of our thinking when we think about remainders of MDG and post-2015 development agenda. And very much my hope that government could focus how this concept could be reflected. Second issue is a survey found that human security approach has contributed coordination of among UN country team and their partners. Evidence is clear from the ground the realization of greater impact when different UN agencies, funds, and programs come together to address cross-cutting challenge. Applying human security approach to joint programming has allowed them to analyze the situation of insecurity from a broader perspective and maximize impact. Third, like case in Ghana and many other cases we can draw, human security approach has contributed to improving cooperation between UN country team and the host government. This is especially the case at provincial and municipal levels. Working with one UN joint program reduces administrative burden on local government because it's uh, just deal with one team, not separate UN entities. It's also focused, fosters a stronger relationship between UN country team and local governments. Moreover, human security focus on building local capacity is very important because it encourages greater institutional coordinations not only national level, but also local level. First point, the survey found that human security's people-centered approach has contributed building capacity and empowering local partners and community members. It has enabled these people to participate in the project identification, formulation, planning, and monitoring process. So actions are formulated according to their needs and aspirations and the interest. Thus promote longer sustainability and self-reliance effort. But at the same time, the survey uncovers some issues and challenges. I draw you three. First one is understanding approach, human security, despite all the effort that is not well understood yet in global sense. I think further effort is needed, and the adoption of common understanding by General Assembly will help this process of advocacy and knowledge sharing. Second issue is that uh, UN operational system tend to be compartmentalized because they are specialized. Every program has their own specialized area. So they are not necessarily conducive to implementing integrated multi-sectoral program that human security approach requires. So implementing this approach requires programs across the UN agencies be harmonized to allow UN country team the flexibility to respond to needs, interests identified by target populations. Recent effort to strengthen those partnerships in chief executive board, including World Bank, is encouraging development. Finally, funding donor culture, because donors tend to allocate funds to specific issues or themes of their interest, making very difficult sometimes to adequately fund multi-sectoral integrated program. Very few donors come. UN Trust Fund is unique in a sense because it is created for purpose, for just for that purpose. In the past decade, as you noticed, UN has benefited very much from this UN uh, Trust Fund funded project, but it has a limited uh, resource base. Comprehensive and multi sectoral work require time and resources to bring strong partnership with UN, within UN, but also between UN and others. 
despite this effort, uh, uh, the, their colleagues, many survey respondents voiced the same uh, message, comparing message for implementing human security in the work of the UN. Because it's for particular value, we emphasize equity inclusiveness. So we should focus on those people who are vulnerable, disadvantaged, disenfranchised, or even sometimes neglected, and not left behind. When human security even can make effort to bridge this fragmented agenda. So in that way, integrated response to complex challenges will be met. I very much like to uh, close this, uh, I take this opportunity by thanking many member states and uh, all of our partners who are active interest in this survey and quite sure these responses offer us very valuable lessons as we proceed. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much. I believe that you have quite appropriately indicated the need for this comprehensive multi-sectoral work which is coordinated and harmonized both inside the states and within the United Nations system for this concept to make progress. All of those states who have not responded to consultations now have an important task before them, which is to contribute their own points of view to enrich the report of the Secretary General. Please allow me now to give the floor to the second speaker for this afternoon, Mr. Dale Thompson, who will make a presentation on the independent rapid impact assessment of the activities of the UN Trust Fund for Human Security. Mr. Thompson was a senior advisor of uh, the Universidad Management Group uh, in Ottawa, and he is a high official of the Government of Canada. Mr. Thompson, you have the floor, sir. Thank you very much. Um, Presentation, please. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Ambassador, Excellencies, Ministers, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Dale Thompson, and I am the team leader of a Canadian from a Canadian consulting company, Universalia Management Group, which has undertaken this rapid assessment of a selection of projects supported by the United Nations Trust Fund for Human Security. And with respect, Mr. Ambassador, I'm no longer a senior official of the Government of Canada. I'm in the retired category <laughs> these days. At the commencement, however, I should like to take this opportunity on behalf of my two teammates to express our gratitude to the staff and management of UN offices worldwide, to the personnel specifically of the Human Security Unit, and to the staff and senior officials of many of UN agencies at their headquarters, all of whom graciously shared their time and their insights with my colleagues and I. But more importantly, I think, and, and recalling the photographs that were taken and the video in Uganda, I think it is especially apt within the context of human security that my colleagues and I would like to thank the individual men and women, the boys and girls, who were the beneficiaries of these projects and who themselves willingly shared their times, their hope, and their dreams with us. This rapid assessment was commissioned by the advisory board as a contribution to the ongoing dialogue about the human security as approach as a whole. And it very much complements the work that the uh, special advisor to the Secretary General just spoke about a moment ago. A rapid assessment is a kind of program performance measurement instrument that is custom tailored to, peculiar, to particular circumstances, but which is firmly based in contemporary program evaluation methodology. However, unlike a classic evaluation, a rapid assessment can be tightly focused, as is the case in this particular assignment. And in terms of that focus, 
We reviewed a number of projects on a face-to-face -face basis, and we were especially concerned about engaging the beneficiary populations themselves. We did so with five projects. In addition, we conducted a number of desktop studies, telephone interviews, in relation to several other recent projects. We also conducted a parallel electronic survey of country team members, government officials, and, and other beneficiaries, and we received a, a relatively satisfactory response rate to that. Today, as part of your package, you received an overview report uh, of our overall study. Now, you can see here that the objectives of this rapid assessment were highly strategic in nature. And they focused really on identifying the benefits of the human security approach as it has been recently rolled out through demonstration projects undertaken through the most recent set of guidelines. And it is very important to emphasize that the time frame for the selection of the projects which we reviewed coincided with the most recent iteration of the guidelines so that we would be able to see the evolution and also uh, examine the current impact of the successive improvements that have been undertaken over the last few years. Now, our mandate was to firmly look at these four issues, value, impact, usefulness, and then to do lessons learned. We did not examine, in a classic sense, efficiency or effectiveness of the guidelines as a whole. That wasn't our mandate, nor frankly, in my estimation, would doing so at this time have been truly relevant to the global dialogue uh, which is necessary so that we can begin the process which successive speakers have referred to, namely the integration of the human security approach firmly into the future directions of the United Nations and especially with respect to the articulation of new global goals in the post-2015 era. These core questions that you see before you complemented the four objectives. And I want to take a special opportunity this afternoon to thank the members of the advisory board for articulating these questions. What they did is they gave more specificity to the work of my colleagues and I. They allowed it to, they allowed our work to drill down to a greater extent. But each one of these questions is a question in themselves. And as you can see, I, I'm very pleased this afternoon to be able to advise you that the answer to every one of these questions that you see before you is yes. A strong, powerful yes. Is it breaking new ground? Are there added values? Is there impact? Are field teams beginning? The answer is yes. I could conclude now, but I'm not going to because now I'm going to drill down for just a moment or two into what we consider to be the core strategic objective of adding value. And based on a review of the projects and also subsequently complemented by our telephone interviews with global stakeholders, we are of the view that there is considerable added value to the application of the human security approach in comparison to more traditional siloed approaches either in the developmental or humanitarian context. There is something different here. And it is apparent that the multi-sectoral nature of the design and implementation of these contemporary projects constitutes something very different for the experience of field staff. And remember, these are projects at the country level that engage field staff directly. And we were somewhat taken aback I mean, in several of the countries that we visited by the degree to which UN field level personnel were, and their immediate supervisors, were saying, well, this is really the very first time 
that we had ever worked together in a truly collaborative fashion. Yes, we may have packaged a project or two together, but this is the first time we managed it from start to finish. This is the first time when we encountered difficulties. We just didn't follow our own individual work plans, but we came together with the stakeholders, the men and women, and the government officials in an iterative fashion to make a better intervention. And you know, there's probably another value than just this notion that working together can be better. And it is the extent in our minds to which these projects highlight the holistic nature of the challenges to human security that are faced by communities and by extension by individual men and women, boys and girls. As many speakers this afternoon have indicated, the human condition is itself multidimensional and thus to ameliorate the, the threats to human security, we need approaches that are in themselves philosophically different than trying to fix this problem or that problem, but not the sense of the whole. We were asked to focus on the usefulness of the human security approach over more traditional means of either developmental or humanitarian intervention. And we came to the general conclusion that there are considerable intrinsic value in the human security approach over more traditional means. We witnessed instances, and it was fascinating to see the clip from Uganda. It, uh, it reminded me of, of, of my time there on the field mission. Of projects responding more effectively to what people themselves saw as their challenges. They needed microcredit. They needed a marketing system. They told us what they needed. And this is very different, with all due respect, to a lot of our previous efforts in our various agencies where external partners tend to identify what we think is good for you and not necessarily what you may think is good for yourself and your own needs. And this bottom-up empowerment is one of the fundamental characteristics of the human security approach which differentiates it from rights-based approaches or other. It is truly a notion of the holistic of empowerment of individuals and communities. And this approach very well goes beyond what we consider to be more structured approaches that have, uh, have been advocated in the past. Now, this is all right, but one of the most striking observations about the usefulness of the human security approach, we actually heard from a member of the advisory board who counseled us to view the human security approach in the whole. It is not a mechanistic process. It is not steps to be followed from a manual. Rather, it is in essence a new paradigm of thinking about the relationships which are inherent in the application of the UN Charter as a whole. It's not so much a process is it's a way of understanding and responding to the challenges of the human condition. Now, the impact. This, as we all know, in the development or humanitarian fields is a crucial question. And this is one that wasn't in the initial four. But we felt, and my, my team and I felt, that it was essential, if there was beneficiary impact, to raise it. And it is equally important that you know, we just don't talk about whether the projects had UN teams working together or that the planning system worked right. We really had to come to a question of did these projects actually make a difference for the beneficiaries themselves? And more importantly, is that difference distinguishable from what might have occurred in other instances? Now, my colleagues and I are pleased to report today that in virtually every one of the projects we reviewed, there was a discernible impact on the lives and livelihoods of the participation. 
And we saw that these impacts, the combination of agricultural production with microfinance, as the gentleman on the video showed, to result in increased production, the combination in Uzbekistan of health measures along with infrastructure measures to result in better health that could not be obtained through strictly doing one thing and then one thing. These instances transcend what might have been a traditional humanitarian response. And they have spoken very much as well. Another impact is these were things and concepts and needs that people themselves saw. We witnessed how, they came, how people in their communities engaged government officials in a bottom-up planning process. And in many respects, especially in the, uh, the post-conflict environment, there was a building of, of, of a true sense of peace within the definition of the United Nations and within specifically the charter of UNESCO, peace in the hearts of mankind. We witnessed increased production rates and strengthening of the economy. Now, at this point, how are you going to say this? Why are you saying this? Development evaluation struggles mightily with the question of development impact. How can you say this? Well, one of the things we benefited from was the use of very cutting edge contemporary approaches to program evaluation called contribution analysis, which is rooted in the development of theories of change. We utilize these techniques to show what contribution the trust fund supported projects made. I would not be honest with you if I said that all the, all the results we saw were solely the work of the trust fund. That would be hyperbole. But what we, as professional evaluators in a company of over 30 years experience, we are relatively confident in stating that the trust fund supported projects materially contributed to making this kind of a positive difference. And I think this is a major lesson. Now finally, in terms of impact, there was an intangible impact. People themselves expressed their degree of pride in participating as individuals in these projects. Their degree of personal empowerment, you can't measure this. There's no way to measure it. But you got the feeling in community gatherings that people were genuinely more, had a greater sense of their own worth. It's extremely hard to, 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 to put that into words, but that's what we felt and we saw. Now there are several lessons and three are paramount. First, there are very clearly organizational as well as programmatic benefits to be obtained when UN agencies work together at the project level within the context of the human security approach. That is the value added, the concept of the, con the human security approach, not merely working together per se. Second, the demonstration projects supported by the trust fund combined as we have heard in a number of instances this afternoon, with the consensus resolution, firmly prove the viability and worth of the human security approach at the intellectual and as well as at the practical level. Third, there is an awareness that the human security approach is philosophically different. We witnessed this at the country level where people said there's something special about this that's not just in, like, Work, UN working together, UN deliver as one. And that there is an inherent philosophical value to it. But this last lesson has a corollary, and we have heard it address a number of instances, and uh, the special advisor to the Secretary General spoke about it quite particularly. Final lesson we came with is that notwithstanding all these benefits that the demonstration projects have shown, there are strong organizational dynamics within the UN system which deter, which tend to diffuse the strengths and benefits of the human security approach and its integration across the system. 
institutional and organizational barriers like planning and resource allocation systems and how UN agencies even collaborate among themselves at the field level in country teams and also at headquarters tends to deter the integrative and holistic approaches that fundamentally characterize the human security as approach. And we heard the Secretary General earlier this afternoon promote the human security approach as a whole of the problem approach, an approach that addresses the totality. Some of these barriers, institutional and organizational, deter that strength. We also have to report something else, that in some instances the human security approach, especially in certain parts, at the, you know, in the resource management part, is seen as a demonstration kind of an activity that we got money from the trust fund. And it is something that isn't fully integrated. Well, human security is the trust fund and that money. And this, this is a problem because human security is broader than that. What one of the, what one of the uh, advisory board members says, it's not just a thing, it's a way of thinking. And this may be a problem because of the lack of consensus until um, last September, and it also may be a problem, with all due respect, about the possibility of a lack of true priority in being placed on the issues. And I think we've heard our, our, our colleague, the Special Advisor, in, in, infer to that. So as Madame Ogata uh, indicated uh, a little while ago in her remarks, it appears to us that human security has yet to become everybody's business. Now, finally, our rapid assessment was mandated to address these four factors, and our overall conclusion is clear. Within the context of the, of, of the projects developed and with, uh, and with slightly broader interpretation, human security approach is effective. It works. It is not something that's special or in the corner. It has filled unaddressed gaps, gaps that others have not been able to do or have overlooked. It has empowered stakeholders, governments, UN agencies, but more importantly, men and women themselves to design measures that meet their needs. And it is producing at that project level more than a discussion of the worth of an idea. It is showing positive beneficiary impact. Now, in conclusion, my mandate and my colleagues' mandate was to explore broad lines of recommendations as well. And we feel, however, that today this is not the forum to discuss specific or detailed recommendations. However, we note that the uh, remaining challenges to the greater adoption of the human security approach lie not in the definition, not in its worth, not even as a mechan... And it, these lie in how the UN itself functions and how it can adopt to new ways of thinking. So we echo many of the remarks that have been made this afternoon and have the following general recommendation to offer. Thank you very much again for your time. My colleagues and I were privileged to have the opportunity to have made this positive contribution, and I look forward to an opportunity to engage in a dialogue with you uh, throughout the balance of the afternoon. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much, Mr. Thompson. What you have pointed out to us is very important and how the UN Trust Fund is supporting your programs as well as how it is affecting the empowerment of individuals and communities who are the beneficiaries of your program. Now, please allow me to give the floor to our following speaker who needs no introduction. 
Ms. Helen Clark, the Administrator of the United Nations Development Program. Helen had a major political career previously in her country, and as Prime Minister, she was highly committed to all policies linked to development, both nationally and internationally. You have the floor. Thank you, Your Excellency, Excellencies. It's uh, close to 20 years since the concept of human security was promoted in global development discourse by UNDP through the 1994 Human Development Report on Human Security. And that report defined human security as having two key elements, freedom from want and freedom from fear. The concept was then picked up and supported at the World Summit for Social Development in, in Copenhagen. Fast forward uh, these past 18 years, we find the concept of human security relevant right across the work of UNDP, uh, whether we're talking poverty reduction and food security, whether we're talking disaster risk reduction and climate change, uh, whether we're talking rule of law and citizen security in communities, it has very wide application. The work we do in this area has been greatly assisted by funding from the United Nations Trust Fund for Human Security, for which we are currently the largest implementer of projects. And I want to put on the record our great appreciation to Japan for its generosity to this fund. We see the human security concept continuing to influence uh, regional and global development debates. For example, in 2009, UNDP's Arab Human Development Report directly addressed human security de deficits in the region. That report proved to be eerily prophetic. Most recently, we see in the global consultations on the post-2015 agenda, uh, in particular on the discussion on how conflict, armed violence and disasters impact on development, human security approaches coming to uh, the fore. And in the uh, consultation uh, culminating in a very important meeting in uh, Helsinki, uh, participants uh, called for an integrated, comprehensive, human security centred and human rights based approach for the post-2015 development agenda. Increasingly, we will see extreme poverty concentrated where there is conflict and armed violence, where there is a lack of resilience to disaster, where there is weak governance and weak states, and where there's competition for scarce resources. Clearly, we need comprehensive human security-based approaches to be tackling these multi-dimensional uh, facets and drivers of continued extreme poverty. I think with respect to the added value of the approach, we would say that it leads to a much deeper and broader analysis of the root causes and consequences of the insecurities which are undermining people's lives. And that in turn leads to initiatives which encompass development, human rights and peace and security. By their very nature, such initiatives must be multi-sectoral, they must be collaborative both across and within the UN family and beyond with national partners and with communities. And we do have many examples of such work which the Trust Fund has uh, supported. Indeed, uh, the Trust Fund uh, by some years predated uh, the delivering as one approach to get greater coordination in the United Nations system. But the challenge is, as Dale Thompson has just elaborated, to mainstream this way of working uh, in the UN system and I look forward to the detailed recommendations of the consultants because I think they will not only help promote the human security approach uh, to development but uh, could also uh, stand to support uh, those of us who carry the torch for better UN coordination in the field. A human security approach demands a clear focus on what the actual needs and actual capacities of governments, of local actors, of communities are, so that responses can be well uh, targeted to meeting the challenges. 
And one example of, of so many one could cite uh, that we've worked on has been in El Salvador, which has uh, experienced extremely high crime rates, including homicide uh, rates. Uh, with the support of human security approach and the, the trust fund, we've been able to work to get a significant reduction of those rates in some of the most violent cities in the country through support for local governance, rule of law and citizen security. And critical to all that was organisation of local crime prevention communities which designed citizen security plans and other specific measures done with the full participation of the community. It's very satisfying to see a substantial decline in homicides as these initiatives have taken root. We were also asked for this panel to look at some of the challenges in applying human security approaches and they've, they've been canvassed already but let me underline it again. Sometimes the concept of human security is confused with the concept of national security or national safety and that can create concerns for some member states. At UNDP we think it's very important to firmly ground the human security approach in development perspectives. Then human security approaches do focus on this longer term capacity building and development and institutional change. This is not short term work. The issues which undermine human security are simply not susceptible to simplistic solutions. So it needs to be understood that following human security approaches takes time and patience and resources. You've got to hang in there for the longer term. There aren't quick wins here. They won't be sustained. Overall then, we find human security a highly relevant concept in framing initiatives to promote jointly poverty eradication, equity and sustainability. The approach encourages us to look deeper into the causes of insecurity, to focus on the actual needs of cap capacities of governments and peoples and combine our strengths with others to mobilise the wide range of skills which are necessary to address complex challenges. And I hope uh, this uh, event today, the report of the consultants, uh, can really also be an important motivation for greater UN coordination in the field because no one of us working alone can address the many dimensions uh, of human security. Thank you, Your Excellency. Gracias, señora. Thank you, Ms. Clark. what you've told us about the impact of the concept of human security on the work of the UNDP has been very important, as well as the need to make the concept cross-cutting in the United Nations. It is good that you've reminded us that human security calls for time, patience and resources. Thank you very much. I'd like to let you know that Ms. Clark will have to leave the meeting at around 5 p.m because she has an unavoidable prior commitment. I shall now give the floor to our next speaker, Ambassador Laura Thompson, Deputy Director General of the International Organization for Migration. Ambassador Thompson has a long-standing experience at the United uh, Nations as a representative of her country uh, at the United Nations headquarters in Geneva, her important work for the UNCHR as well as for the IOM. Madam, you have the floor. Gracias, Señor Presidente. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Excellencies, it is an honor for me, on behalf of the International Organization for Migration, to join this distinguished group of speakers at this high-level event on human security. IOM welcomes very much this timely discussion of an issue that it is even more important in our interconnected world and one of the principal challenges facing the global community and its 7 billion citizens in this 21st century. 
I am commitment to the pursuit of human security for individuals first and foremost for societies is unwavering and matches our belief that humane and orderly migration benefits migrants and societies. Our experience with the Trust Fund has highlighted the added value of the human security approach that is based not only, as was mentioned before, on individual person, personal security, but also on addressing community security as a whole. The focus is above all on putting people at the center and not on simply providing assistance for immediate needs or imposing solutions on people as beneficiaries, as you mentioned, Mr. Thompson. It is on empowering people and looking at improving the human condition. Its comprehensiveness encourages a deeper and broader analysis of the root causes and consequences of threats that threat people everyday lives. Besides encouraging partnership within the UN system and the broader international community, it encourages cooperation with local authorities, civil society, different community actors and media, leading to a more sustainable, comprehensive and integrated approach to helping vulnerable groups. This concept of human security is indeed fundamental for an organization like the International Organization for Migration, whose core mandate relates to people, migrants, that face several and different vulnerabilities and insecurities, and to an issue, migration, that is one of the most cross-cutting issues that exist. IOM has implemented 10 UN trust fund projects with a total value of $8.5 billion, million dollars. I wish it was billion dollars. <laughs> in Costa Rica, Egypt, Ethiopia, Indonesia, Kenya, Mexico, Moldova, Nicaragua, Panama, and Thailand in recent years. And in doing so, so we have learned a great deal and influenced very much the way we approach people and issues. I will give you a couple of examples of things that we have done and maybe the lessons that we have learned on those. In Moldova, applying the human security approach helped us to focus the attention of all stakeholders participating on two less traditional security threats, but with nonetheless wide social implications that are the domestic violence and the human trafficking. IOM worked with the government of Moldova, civil society, UNDP, UNFPA, and OSCE to protect and empower the victims of trafficking and domestic violence through a two-pronged approach. The first one, from the bottom up, in partnership with relevant community-level governmental officials, civil society actors, and media, to empower communities and individuals and from the top-down approach in partnership with appropriate governmental institutions to strengthen the protection system of the country. This holistic human security approach has resulted in the expansion of available services to vulnerable groups, victims or potential victims of trafficking and of domestic violence. In Kenya, we worked with UNDP, FAO, WHO, UNICEF, ILO and OCHA to help vulnerable pastoralist groups under threat by climate change. The project is empowering local communities and building on local capacities to preserve human dignity, reduce intercommunal cross-border tensions, and promote social and economic development, with a particular focus on, on youth. Activities to promote peace, building sensitization, for coexistence and environmental stewardship among the youth include some very interesting activities like, like sports for peace, uh, bicycling peace runs and matches, uh, football matches, and three planting exercises. IOM is also raising awareness and building the capacity of local and provincial authorities, uh, immigration officers and other partners on risk factors of irregular migration uh, and how to promote safe migration and how to use safe migration as an adaptation strategy for those climate change challenges. 
I could mention additional relevant experiences from the other projects that we are implementing, like the one that the distinguished uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs of Thailand mentioned in, in Thailand, that highlight the strong benefits of the more comprehensive and partnership-oriented approach which we believe the Trust Fund on Human Security has brought to our work and that of our partners. But as with anything that is worthwhile and life-changing, there are some challenges uh, to be faced and overcome. And I would like to mention two particular challenges. The first one is that from our experience, it has been challenging to implement the human security vision with local partners that are not fully equipped to carry out such projects with a people-centric approach which empowers the populations. This has required and continues to require understanding and developing of the capacities of local authorities, NGOs, communities and individuals through the provision of information, training, technical assistance, as well as continuous communication and coaching. That has in some cases delayed our, the implementation of the programs. Another challenge that we have faced, and I hope that uh, with the uh, adoption of the resolution of the General Assembly, this is going to diminish, is that the lack of clarity and common understanding of the concept of human security and its implications at the practical level, particularly in what are often changing and challenging political contexts. These circumstances affect the capacity and the priorities of governmental authorities, which have the overall responsibility in the human security approach and requires a continuous dialogue and adaptation of projects to ensure efficiency and ownership. In conclusion, let me reiterate my organization's firm belief that the broad and comprehensive scope of the human security approach is well suited, suited to strengthening the partnerships within the international community. This approach not only taps into the expertise and comparative advantage of each one of the participating agencies. It also contextualizes it to the local dynamics and ensures that the human dimension, dimension is the heart of what we are doing. The simultaneous bottom-up and top-down approach encourages governmental ownership and sustainability. Addressing also the root causes of insecurity, the human security approach encourages a truly multisectoral response to contemporary multidimensional challenges, and migration is certainly one of them. I would like to express our sincere appreciation to the member states, the trust fund donors, the advisory board on human security, and the human security unit in particular for the excellent leadership and cooperation in this. Thank you very much. Gracias, Embajador. Muchas gracias, Thank you very much, Ambassador. I believe that your uh, statement enriches the potential of human uh, security to deal with a multi-sectoral and multidisciplinary way of dealing with threats uh, to vulnerable sectors, which can be migrant sectors in some cases. Thank you very much for stating so well what the challenges and possibilities are. I would now like to give the floor to our next uh, distinguished speaker, the permanent representative of Honduras to the United Nations. Ambassador Flores was a, a vice president of the National Congress of Honduras. There, she championed uh, different policies linked to, to constitutional reform, the health uh, sector reform, human rights, transparency, etc., which are very closely linked to the concept of human security. You have the floor, Ambassador. Your Excellencies, distinguished delegates. In October 1998, merciless nature unleashed her fury on my country, blurring the picturesque map of Honduras. For uh, several dark days and terrible nights, which seemed to last forever, the merciless hurricane of biblical consequences hovered uh, motionless over the Atlantic coast of Honduras. Violent gusts of wind 
shook the fragile topography and rooting decades of modest progress. Raging waters swept away the very core of our heritage. We lost thousands of precious human lives. One third of our population had no refuge uh, from the storm. They were stripped of everything they owned. The grievous harm uh, struck a savage blow to the already unsteady infrastructure. It did away with the entire harvest and it sank the already feeble economy. But even worse, it abruptly changed the familiar order of daily life. It undid the rules of consistency. It unraveled the fragile uh, social uh, te uh, texture, it uh, broke habits and security, and it opened the floodgates of migration from the country to the city, from people's own places uh, to other places, from the certain to the uncertain. A sudden blow from nature, without a whisper of war warning, hopes and dreams for life were reduced in a split second and reduced to the immediate need to survive. This much discussed concept of human security captured our attention when for the first time we read it in the report on human development, Honduras 1999, the human impact of a hurricane, which deals with human security at risk, setting the experiences of people who were affected by the, by the disaster. The weight of that nightmare is best summarized in the improvised uh, testimony of a humble inhabitant of Santa Rosa de Aguan. She said, never had I seen anything like this. Uh, it affected us uh, so much so that uh, our trauma is every time that a little rain falls, we already begin to worry. Before, we never uh, really knew what a hurricane was, nor what caused it and everything that we saw. When we were here during the days of the hurricane, there were strong winds. It was two in the morning. We didn't know how to get out of our homes. Along the main street, uh, a corpse uh, floated by, and a neighbor cried out, saying that people were drowning because people were jumping out of their windows because of the wind and ended up drowning. It was something dreadful. This unique uh, experience, which we hope will never be repeated, leaves us with a gamut of individual stories, which today, more than a decade after that terrible plight, are recited with silent tears of pain, with palpitations, and with broken voices. There are no indicators nor statistics measuring the feelings, the deep suffering, and the irreversible trauma affecting people. What price can we put on dignity? In her pride, wounded because of the powerlessness of having nothing to feed a hungry child, or the way in which life has suddenly turned completely upside down, people losing their entire, um, all of their uh, possessions, leaving their customary homes, the loss for a mother who was helpless, uh, helpless against uh, the raging waters that dragged away uh, her loved one, as she struggled uh, to bring them to a safe place, defying the current. No lifeless object will make up for the pain or restore this loss. So much, uh, uh, so much despair and security have led us to a way out of the crisis with a plan for uh, care, rescue, which uh, I then went on to our uh, poverty eradication strategy with a strong focus on human security. Although we have uh, developed major uh, initiatives to restore normalcy, we were unable to respond to the avalanche of problems without cooperation on all levels from community volunteers to international assistance. For us, human security is probably best understood as the broadest reflection of solidarity. That which makes it possible for us to uh, surpass the tra traditional patterns of security in the national context and recognize the essence of humanity and the identity of each individual. 
for vulnerable countries with situations similar to our own, where scarcity and threats uh, go beyond their response capacity and affect uh, individual and uh, family subsistence on a daily basis, the meaning of sec human security has a supreme, urgent, and indispensable value. The Forum of the United Nations, which protects international peace and security, after the UNDP report of 1994, the World Summit of 2005, where we are called to study and agree on a concept, the thematic debates and the reports of the Secretary General of 2010 and 2012 have brought us today to a generally understood consensus expressed in Resolution 66-290 of September 2012. In this context, the unchanneled forces of nature, organized crime, illegal trafficking in goods and people, armed conflicts on a national and regional level are harsh realities which affect uh, thousands of people throughout the world. We believe that human security is a solution to this and other major problems that spill over our uh, domestic backyards and are found in this new century of extended coexistence anywhere where there is a feeling of common responsibility for global citizens who have more than one home or nationality, immigrants and refugees uh, who need to live uh, free of fear and need with a recourse to call for their full human rights, their identity, heritage, culture, religion, health, justice, and the right to build their own future. A person enjoying human security with access to the necessary information to face adversity, participate in the system, make the most of opportunity, and build governance, does not have any reason to feel that they risk their sovereignty or uh, put their self-determination at risk. The greatest resource of a state is not economic or uh, military force, but rather the potential of their human resources. Human security is, an, uh, is a vital ingredient for justice to be done since it must be applied to a specific case of an individual and circumstances in accordance with the law. People must have the certainty of their human rights and the guarantees to defend themselves and thus fulfill the responsibilities that the law, rule of law requires. Wisława Simbolska, in her poem Hunger Camp in Jaslo uh, says that uh, the individual in the context of security uh, it symbolizes as follows. History counts its skeletons in round numbers. A thousand and one is still a thousand, as if there had never been a single one. An imaginary embryo, an empty cradle, an unread ABC, air that laughs, cries, grows, runs down the steps to the empty garden. Nobody's place in the line. We stand in the meadow where it was made flesh. The meadow is as silent as a false witness, sunny and green. From the time we are born, our natural instinct drives us to seek uh, and secure that uh, sweet security we had in our mother's wombs. It is something we need to grow and prosper. The United Nations, as a guarantor of world peace and security, definitely depends on the will of nations, but everything depends upon the well-being and safety of individuals, and nothing will happen without that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ambassador, for your statement. Thank you for giving us the viewpoint of a member state. I would now like to invite our next speaker, Ambassador Tite Antonio, Permanent Observer of the African Union to the United Nations, who will give us a presentation on behalf of Ambassador Ramtane Lamramra, the Commissioner uh, of the African Union and member of the Advisory Board on Human Security. For reasons of force measure, Ambassador Lamramra has not been able to join us this afternoon. Ambassador Antonio, you have the floor. Thank you, sir. I, I would like to 
to start by conveying the apologies of uh, uh, Commissioner, uh, His Excellency Ambassador Ramtan Lamamra, Commissioner for Peace and Security of the African Union and member of the Advisory Board on Human Security, who would have loved to be here to, to speak at this very important event, but uh, could not do so due to uh, circumstances uh, uh, beyond his control. He had to cancel the trip to New York at the last minute and has therefore uh, uh, directed me to deliver the following statement on his behalf. Uh, I thank you very much for giving the AU the opportunity to contribute to this high-level event on a subject that confronts us all on a daily basis. We have been asked to focus on the AU contribution on the relevance and added value of human security from regional for, for bet, or better still, African perspective. The relevance of this issue cannot be overemphasized. The issue is certainly of critical importance to us in Africa, given the peculiarities of security and development challenges in our own part of the world. Mr. Chairman, the solemn declaration and the adoption of a common African defense and security policy of the African Union in 2004 is premised on a common African perception of what is re required to be done collectively by African states to ensure that Africa's common defense and security interests and goals, especially as is set out in our Articles 3 and 4 of the Constitutive Act of the African Union, are safeguarded in the face of common threats to the continent as a whole. The AU's understanding of security in, in, encompasses both the traditional state-centric notion, which is informed by the current in, international environment, and the growing number of in, interstate conflict. The causes of interstate conflict necessitate a new emphasis on human security, based not only on political values, but also on social and economic imperative as, a, as well. The Solent Declaration does recognize this newer, multidimensional notion of security that embraces such issues as human rights, the right to participate fully in the process of governance, the right to protection against poverty, the right to con conductive education and health conditions, the right to protection against marginalization on the basis of gender, protection against natural disaster, as well as ecological and environmental degradation. At the national, regional, as well as the continental levels, the Common African Defense and Security Policy aims at safeguarding the security of individuals, families, communities, and the state national life in the economic, political, and social dimensions with the understanding that the security of each African country is inseparately linked to, the, to that of African countries and the African continent as a whole. This is in paragraph six of the Common African Defense and Security Policy. Mr. Chairman, the scourge of conflicts in Africa constitutes a major impediment to their social economic development and that promoting peace, security, and stability continues to be a prerequisite for Africa's development and integration. Against this background, the African peace and security architecture was formulated, guided by, amongst others, by the need for a new purposeful continental organization well, dedic well dedic dedicated to dealing with emerging demand in Africa and the world as, uh, at large. Programs of the African Union have both been formulated to address the human security needs of member states. The Continental Early Warning System, that promotes proactiveness in preventing violent conflict by focusing on structural prevention of conflict. The African Union Standby Force will, amongst other, be deployed to assist countries faced with natural disasters and attendant 
human security challenges. The AU policy on post-conflict reconstruction and development as, as a main objective, the, the prevention of relapse into conflict by addressing the tool, the root causes of the conflict. A good number of policies and programs in various fields aim at ensuring food security through the eradication of hunger, ensure human security through eradication of diseases, and eradication of poverty, as I already referred to. In conclusion, new challenges such as inter international terrorism, post-conflict stagnation, pollution, climate change, human trafficking, transnational crime, HIV, AIDS, north-south imbalance, and the widening gap between the, the rich and the poor constitute additional threats to human insecurity. We need a concerted effort to ensure that however, whoever, however we view or define human security, what matter, matters is the humankind must be put at the center of all our security and development efforts. I am pleased to inform this gathering that the African Union had just received a request for partnership from the UN Center for Regional Development based in Nairobi, Kenya, in partnership with the UN Department for Economic and Social Affairs to implement a project aimed at promoting the human security concept, norms, and practice to enhance sustainable peace and development in Africa. As the African Union celebrates 50 years of OAU, OA, 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 AU, and plans for the future, we will strive to ensure that the human security remains at the center of our endeavors. I thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the Ambassador for that presentation and for your participation here. It's been very useful and very edifying, as well as has been the regional perspective you've provided with us, that from Africa. As we've heard our final speaker, and before opening the floor for comments and questions, I'd like to thank our panelists for their statements. They've talked about very important top topics, such as the added value of human security, a holistic approach, one which is integrated, cross-cutting. They've also told us about the importance of uh, alliances between many actors, of empowering people and communities, the importance of working together in a cross-cutting fashion, mainstreaming the work through agencies, and organizations of the United Nations system. I believe that this has been extremely enriching for everybody who's interested in the concept of human security. Before moving on to opening the uh, question section, I have been requested to explain to you how you must ask for the floor. What you have in front of you is a button in front of the microphone. You must push this button. This button will uh, go green. The green light means that uh, you have been entered on the list of speakers. When you are given the floor, the green light will turn red. When the microphone is red, it is live. And please just speak into it. Do not strike it. Once you have finished taking the floor, to switch the microphone off, simply press the button again and the lights will go off. It's complex. I do hope it will work. So uh, let me go on to the question period.
sí, sí. El la de que aparece no acá en la pantalla. ¿eh? Bueno, si no haremos un sistema más artesanal. Well, we can always use a homegrown system uh, because uh, I can't see anything without my glasses and if I don't see your names on the screen, then... Eslovenia, Sudáfrica, Japón, 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 Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. I speak on behalf of the European Union and its member states. Allow me first to thank the Secretary General for his intervention, as well as all the panelists for their useful remarks about the implementation of the human security approach. The General Assembly made significant progress last year with the adoption of the first substantive resolution on human security. The principles at the core of the human security approach were laid down. On the one hand, the interdependence and mutual reinforcement of the three pillars of the United Nations and, on the other, the full respect for all purposes and principles enshrined in the UN Charter, including the promotion of and respect for human rights and fundamental freedoms for all. Today's event has reminded us that it is time to turn to the implementation of human security at the field level to assess its real impact on people's lives identify best practices and avoid duplications with other ongoing UN work. We are grateful for the feedback provided about projects funded by the Trust Fund on Human Security, from which several lessons can already be extracted. The rapid impact assessment provides useful findings in this regard, which can help us to strengthen even further the focus of the Trust Fund on unaddressed intersectorial areas that risk falling through the cracks of other funding mechanisms. We have also noted that using a bottom-up approach and ensuring an active participation of individuals and their communities is a key measure of success. Human security should remain a tool to continue promoting the rights of those in vulnerable situations, including their representation in decision-making, as well as their access to justice, services, work, and social opportunities. The respect for all human rights and the rule of law must accordingly remain at the core of any application of the human security approach. We reaffirm in this context the primary responsibility of states to fulfill their obligations under, humanitarian, under international human rights and humanitarian law. The European Union will continue supporting a pragmatic and action-oriented way forward with a focus on areas where human security can bring added value in terms of the protection and empowerment of individuals. Thank you very much. Gracias por su comentario. Thank you for that comment. I now give the floor to Slovenia. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I would also like to thank the panelists for their presentations. Uh, I would like to express gratitude to Human Security Unit and the United Nations Trust Fund for Human Security for organizing this important high-level event. It presents a great opportunity to keep focus on the concept. Also, also in the biennium, we are not negotiating a resolution. Being members of the Human Security Network, we are particularly proud to participate in last year's negotiations when the common understanding of the concept was formed. Last year's undertaking was a further awareness-raising step. The spirit of human security has become clearer and therefore entered into the new phase, a phase in which we discuss implementation and exchange of successful practices. Event, events like today's one can serve these purposes. As threats to human security develop, they become more and more interconnected and interrelated. The concept of human security forces us to continuously review our traditional notions of security, keeping hu human beings as the center of our attention at all times. Slovenia believes that the concept is al already being implemented in many ways, not only by states, but also through various non-state actors. 
Excellent examples of direct implementation by non-state actors are United Nations Trust Fund for Human Security that we all know and ITF. International Trust Fund for Enhancing Human Security is a non-governmental organization based in my own country, which successfully concluded many projects, among them, for example, clearing most of the minefields in the Balkans, which enabled local communities to carry out their po post-conflict rebuilding activities and cons consolidate peace and prosperity for communities in these areas. It gives me a pleasure we can welcome ITF at this event, and I hope that they will later have an opportunity to present some of their current projects. Muchas gracias, señor representante. Tiene la palabra. Thank you very much, Thor. The representative of South Africa now has the floor. Thank you, Excellency. Um, South Africa thanks the Secretary General, Madam Ogata, Dr. Putsuwan, and Madam Picado, and other distinguished panelists for their valuable and insightful statements. We also express our appreciation to the permanent representative of Chile, Ambassador Octavia. Erasuritz for facilitating today's interactive panel to which South Africa attaches great importance. Excellency, my delegation is pleased to note the encouraging findings emanating from the overview report of the rapid assessment of the United Nations Trust Fund for Human Security. The findings strongly underscore the value of the holistic, multiple, dimensional and integrated approach espoused by the human security concept. The positive results in several countries show that this approach has yielded concrete outcomes by delivering sustainable solutions to the human security challenges faced by vulnerable people and communities. We are pleased to note that recent projects funded by the United Nations Trust Fund for Human Security have resulted in tangible benefits for people and communities in Uganda, Colombia, Uzbekistan, Mongolia and others. And this has been done through empowering people and communities through local ownership and active participation in the design and planning of projects using multi-sectoral strategies for long-term sustainability and the creation of opportunities for sustainable livelihoods at local and community levels. Excellency, as a concept of human security and the benefits it holds for addressing development, human rights and peace and security challenges in a more holistic and integrated manner is further elaborated on within the UN system. We believe that it is possible to expand the common understanding of the concept among member states and the wider UN system. We are encouraged that the concept of human security finds resonance in the African Union Common Defence Strategy. My delegation believes that the human security approach should be directed towards seeking solutions to the challenges of poverty eradication, underdevelopment and inequality, and the prevention and eradication of communicable diseases in the broader framework of the MDGs. The projects funded by the Trust Fund for Human Security are to be commended. South Africa has in recent years been the beneficiary of two highly successful trust fund projects and we remain ready to engage constructively in further discussions on the concept and its implementation and how it can be utilized for empowering and creating better lives for the world's most poor, vulnerable and marginalized citizens. I thank you. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much for your contribution. Now let me give the floor to the distinguished representative of Japan. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. At the outset, I would like to express my government's uh, deep gratitude for all the speakers for their rich presentations and the hard work put in by the Human Security Unit of OCHA to realize this event. We welcome especially Mrs. Ogata, the former co-chair of the Commission on Human Security who is with us here today. Today is truly a great opportunity for us to hear from all the key players gathered together and benefit from the shared knowledge on achievements and challenges of the activities on human security. Uh, Japan feels honored to co-sponsor this event. GA Resolution 66290, which was adopted last September by consensus, provides a common understanding on the notion of human security. 
My delegation believes it is an excellent basis for the implementation of human security in the activities of the United Nations, the member states, and regional and international organizations. The remarks made by the panelists today contain valuable views and information. My delegation highly values both the good practices and the lessons learned from challenges encountered at various levels in the efforts to promote human security. It is also encouraging to see that the independent rapid assessment has highlighted and underpinned the added value and impact of the human security approach on the ground. Of course, it is crucial that the added value of human security is well understood and disseminated throughout not only the member states, but also the various UN agencies. One way to do this is to incorporate human security at the strategic level of these organizations, such as in their strategic plans and annual reports. Initiatives by the member states and the leadership of the Secretary General and the heads of agencies are also essential for, the main, for mainstreaming human security throughout the UN system. The United Nations Trust Fund for Human Security has been an invaluable tool for the implementation of human security and for its dissemination throughout the UN system. The strength of the trust fund is that it mobilizes multiple UN agen agencies to implement projects. The wisdom and knowledge of each implementing agency are incorporated and utilized in a comprehensive approach to cope with cross-cutting and widespread issues. In this regard, the trust fund projects, projects have built-in mechanisms to enhance operational effectiveness and delivering as one. Japan hopes that the activities of the Trust Fund will be further enhanced through contributions from as many member states as possible. The Government of Japan has submitted to the Diet, our national parliament, a proposed contribution of approximately 10.1 million US dollars to this fund. My delegation would like to invite other member states to make voluntary contributions to the fund as well. The benefits of incorporating human security into international cooperation activities can also be shared at other occasions. For example, the fifth Tokyo International Conference on African Development, TCAD 5, to be held in Japan from 1 to 3 June, which is upcoming very soon, is an excellent opportunity to deepen the understanding on human security. TICAD is co-organized by the Government of Japan, the African Union Commission, the UN, the UNDP, and the World Bank. The TICAD process deals with the persistent challenges which remain in African countries to developing robust and sustainable economies. In this regard, TICAD will be working to lay a solid foundation for the promotion of human security. Mr. Chairman, my delegation strongly hopes that today's event marks a firm step forward in our shared efforts to further promote human security on the ground. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, distinguished delegate. Thank you for contributing uh, to this event uh, by being the co-sponsor as Japan and also for your contribution to the Trust Fund. The representative 3P Human Security now has the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and distinguished panelists. I'm here representing the Global Partnership for the Prevention of Armed Conflict and also the Civil Society Network for Human Security. And we'd like to concur with the rapid assessment. Uh, we agree with the findings of this research and in our own research on human security and what works best in terms of civil society, government, uh, UN partnerships uh, is just one particular lesson learned that I wanted to share today. And that is that civil society partnerships with government work best when there are very specific, concrete uh, mechanisms for consultation and participation, and that these need to be structured in from the beginning. And they can be done in several ways, through social media, through focus groups, and through the creation, as uh, UNDP did in Fiji, of high-level 
multi-stakeholder uh, dialogues, which include civil society, religious leaders, uh, academic leaders, etc. So I wanted to add that into the findings of, of the rapid assessment report. Thank you. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much. The next speaker will be the representative of Argentina, to be followed by the representative of Mexico, and then the representative of Pajo. Argentina now has the floor. Thank you very much, Ambassador, and distinguished uh, chair of this meeting. Let me thank you for your work and the work of the Mission of Chile in convening this meeting. I'm grateful to your entire team, as well as the work done by the Special Advisor of the Secretary General on Human Security and all the work of the Human Security Network of the member countries and the observer countries, South Africa. We are grateful for the work of the Special Advisors and uh, the statement uh, made today, as well as the statement made by Ms. Uh, Sadaka uh, and uh, Mr. Suin Suan, the Foreign Minister of Thailand. We wish to highlight the work uh, being done by the Network for Human Security in recent years, as well as uh, the facilitators of Resolution 626-290 adopted last September. Despite these efforts, Argentina believes that there is still a lack of clarity on the concept of human security, the scope of which led, as we all know, to uh, the negotiation of uh, this resolution during the 66th session being quite protracted and prolonged. We appreciate the debate to clarify the concept, and we believe it is important to move forward in valuable definitions such as the certainty that human security does not uh, include the use of force or coercive measures, nor is it a substitute for state security. In this sense, we reaffirm the great importance of this continued uh, debate based on the interrelationship between peace and uh, human rights, since these are the pillars of the, human, uh, of, of the United Nations, which we all see as essential. This debate should not distract us from the fundamental d discussions on sustainable development. In other words, everything having to do with the social, economic and environmental order, nor should it distract us from the work on the International Agenda for Development beyond 2015, as well as the role of the international community complementing national governments by giving them the necessary support to strengthen their ability to respond to current challenges and uh, emerging ones by encouraging cooperation between governments and uh, regional and international organizations and civil society. Thank you, sir. Thank you, distinguished delegate. The next speaker is a distinguished representative of Mexico. Thank you. Good afternoon, uh, Ambassador. The delegation of Mexico is pleased at the holding of this uh, important high-level event, and we are, of course, grateful to all of the panelists for their valuable input. In human security, Mexico sees three values. First, uh, the application of the concept makes it possible for states to integrate different dimensions in the decisions they take to comply with their obligations uh, to their individual nationals, taking into account their national uh, development priorities. In this sense, this is a relevant uh, focus for decision making. Secondly, it becomes a catalyst for the three pillars of the Charter, Development, Security and Human Rights, which reinforces its uh, multidimensional character. Uh, the third uh, part ensures the empowerment of individuals uh, by involving them in the prevention of threats to their security and in projects such as the ones we've seen today. 
Mexico also believes uh, that uh, this notion of human security is not exclusive to developing countries since people throughout the world can face different conditions of insecurity and therefore their empowerment and protection is a basis for them to live uh, worthy lives uh, without being threatened uh, by conditions of instability that affect development. Like other delegations, uh, since the adoption of uh, Resolution 66 Stroga 290 uh, under the leadership of Japan and Jordan, uh, we wish to welcome the progress made. The analysis of the projects financed uh, by the UN Trust Fund for Human Security until now has made it possible for us to see the added value of the shared notions of development, security, and human rights. We also wish to congratulate the Trust Fund for its work for this reason and for the projects it has launched uh, throughout the years. I would like uh, to ask and also highlight what Ms. Ogata was saying about the need to extend participation of states precisely in the definition of projects and the administration of the trust fund. Looking forward, it would be interesting to review this, especially in the light of the report to be submitted by the Secretary General. The government of Mexico is also pleased at the launching of a project which Ambassador Thompson already mentioned to strengthen institutional uh, government institutions and civil society institutions to improve the protection of migrants' rights transiting whilst transiting through Mexico. This is a project which shows uh, how we put into practice the concepts that have been described here. We hope that this project will develop uh, successfully with this innovative multidimensional focus and as it deals uh, with a particularly vulnerable group, not only in Mexico, but throughout the world, migrants who are in a state of transit. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Thank you, distinguished delegate. Unfortunately, because of time constraints, I will have to ask the remaining speakers to be as succinct as possible when they take the floor. The representative of Pajo now has the floor. <coughs> Thank you very much, Ambassador. Ten years after the report on the Commission on Human Security, which was issued on May 1st of 2003, we wish to congratulate everybody concerned. This is added to the over 63 years referred to by the Ambassador of Chile. American Health Organization. Uh, ours is the regional office of the World Health Organization. Um, after extensive discussions and consultations, the ministers of health of the, uh, that constitute the directing council of the Pan American Health Organization in October 1st of 2010 and 2010 approved a resolution to analyze the inclusion of human security in their health plans, always within their national sovereign legislation. The resolution CD50 uh, R16 asked the Pan American Health Organization Secretariat to follow the global development on the human security debate at United Nations and build with the member states the appropriate guides for policy design and program implementation in public health with the human security approach. PAHO has done that. We have seen the need for the approach to complex interrelated threats that surround many of the communities in the region of Latin America and the Caribbean. We have seen this in practice of the projects funded by the UN Trust Fund, as well as other projects that are just basic public health common sense. We want to continue working on this line. We welcome the General Assembly resolution and we look forward for the years to come in building together country, member states, and United Nations organizations to build together action for the uh, larger freedom and the people's dignity. Thank you very much.
Gracias, señor. Thank you very much, sir. The representative of Cuba now has the floor. Cuba. Thank you very much, distinguished ambassador of Chile. I'm extremely pleased personally and as a member of my delegation to see you leading the work of this panel. I'd also like to thank the other members of the panel for their detailed statements. We would like to make a few comments in our national capacity. Cuba believes that no progress can be made in implementing human security without there being a specific mandate for this purpose. This can only be the result of an agreement by member states. At present, the United Nations has a notion of human security which is based on the balanced understanding reflected in Resolution 66-290 of the General Assembly. In this vein, we wish to highlight that the resolution clearly establishes in OP3 that human security must fully respect the purposes and principles of the Charter, including full respect for the sovereignty of states, territorial integrity, and non-interference in internal affairs of states. Human security does not include the use or threat uh, of force or coercive measures. The resolution also specifies that human security is based on national involvement since political, economic, social, and cultural conditions for human security vary considerably from country to country, and the function of the international community consists, quite logically, of complementing the work of governments and providing them with the necessary support when they so request. This notion of human security must demonstrate its effectiveness in the activities of the United Nations in issues linked to economic and social development. Our delegation also believes that this notion should be borne in mind in the activities of prevention and mitigation of natural disasters, as was correctly stated earlier by some panelists. This would make it possible to respond to global warning, warming, rise in sea levels, uh, the depletion of fossil fuels, and uh, irrational use unsound use of water resources, among other things, all of which are very serious threats to the security of human beings across the world. The notion of human security must be present in United Nations activities directed towards combating child and maternal mortality, hunger, malnutrition, illnesses, pandemics, responding to illiteracy and other evils actions directed to respond to food insecurity and energy insecurity must also be taken into account in this focus. We reiterate that the application of this focus must respect the political, economic, social, and cultural differences of each country. Human security is uh, nothing but a rhetorical phrase if the conditions of underdevelopment and poverty in which most of the world's population live are not rectified. Thank you. Thank you very much. There are three speakers remaining on my list, after which the list is closed so that the panelists will be able to respond. In ten more minutes, I will have to adjourn uh, or rather uh, finish this round of questions so that uh, uh, Mr. Eliasson can take the floor. Egypt now has the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, Egypt welcomes the convening of this high-level uh, event on the notion of human security. Uh, we also appreciate all the various points and elements that were uh, presented by the distinguished panelists this afternoon. And we do associate with most of the key elements referred to in these presentations. 
Mr. Chairman, the successful adoption of Resolution 66-290 has paved the ground through the stipulations of that resolution on the basis of a parameters of a common understanding of the notion of human security, which enabled us to be here today within a consensual framework necessary to continue our discussion within the General Assembly of this notion and most importantly of its parameters for implementation. The advancement of the notion of human security should contribute to realizing sustainable development as well as the internationally agreed development goals including the MDGs and post-2015 which we are discussing right now. Human security has to enable governments to perform their sovereign role in creating an environment conducive to development and to the promotion and protection of all human rights. It has to facilitate the creation of effective partnerships between governments, regional and international organizations, financial institutions and civil society based on the principle of national ownership. Thus, the notion of human security should aim from our perspective to support the nationally identified priorities of countries emerging from conflict and engaged in peace building in order to prevent the relapse into conflict and ensure the accessibility of humanitarian assistance and the exclusion of policies that attempt to enforce economic blockades, famines and collective punishment on people under occupation. It should strengthen and support national and regional capacities to deal with emerging issues such as national disasters, environmental disasters, and those that are man-made, such as climate change, nuclear disasters, and their connection to the acquisition of nuclear weapons, and other weapons of mass destruction, as well as food security and clearing of landmines combating illicit trade in small arms and light weapons and their correlation with transnational organized crime and illicit drug trade, as well as illegal exploitation of natural resources and fueling of armed conflicts. Human security should assist member states in overcoming the development impediments in all their aspects, including food, energy security, fighting hatred and discrimination, on the basis of religion, racism, and racial discrimination, terrorism, human trafficking, and other emerging challenges that impede the realization of the potentials, aspirations of individuals and peoples for progress and prosperity, thus crippling the ability of developing countries to achieve their sustainable development objectives. Human security should contribute and ensure a comprehensive reform and revitalization of the United Nations, international economic, trade and financial institutions, with a view of making them more supportive of development prospects with a framework of transparency and accountability. Finally, Mr. Chairman, the General Assembly is the only UN body that has the mandate to continue the discussion on the notion of human security as per Resolution 66-290. Such dis discussion should focus on the modalities for the application of human security approach in the works of the United Nations. These modalities should include and look into the following. The application of the approach has to be considered by the general membership where each member has an equal right to contribute to the decision-making process including as regards the operations and evaluation of the existing United Nations Trust Fund for Human Security, including as well the consideration of the projects that are being submitted, the modalities of operation of the fund, and the criteria for selection of, the of such projects. The application is to be considered upon the request and with the consent of the concerned state. And finally, the General Assembly has to look into the areas of application and their priority and we are looking forward that such discussion would result in particular uh, identification of certain areas of application by consensus if not unanimity. Thank you Mr. Chair.
Thank you very much. I will now give the floor to ITF Enhancing Human Spirits uh, for a very brief uh, comment. Thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, for giving me the floor and thank, uh, thank to the uh, panelists for their presentation. I will try to be very brief. I'm speaking on behalf of a non-profit organization called ITF Enhancing Human Security, which is based in Ljubljana, Slovenia, as it was mentioned already by the Slovenian ambassador. Let me at this point also thank um, many governments who sit here and have um, made a contribution over 375 million American dollars over these 15 years uh, that ITF is working and performing. ITF is giving priority to projects implemented in countries and regions where the uncertainty of people is most critical and pervasive. With implementation of human security project, ITF has an active role, first and foremost, in mine clearance and eradication of dangers uh, posed by explosive remnants of war, stockpiles of ammunition, as well as through implementation of projects aimed at psychosocial rehabilitation of victims and other affected population. In order to efficiently implement human security projects, ITF works with national authorities and in partnership with donors, NGOs, the private sector and international and regional organizations in order to reduce the threats to human security from post-conflict challenges. And whenever, whenever is possible and wherever is possible uh, in the regional approach, strengthening the uh, confidence building processes. With the support of international donor community, ITF is contributing to increase human security through implementation of joint pro protection strategies, enabling people to act on their own behalf, consequently reducing threats from disruptive challenges. ITF's vision of human security includes social, psychological, political and economic factors with combined prom uh, which combined promote and protect human well-being through time. We focus on prevention, building resilience towards disruptive challenges and not solely uh, rely on post-conflict disaster, disaster rehabilitation reconstruction programs. Let me just mention among 2,800 2, projects that we have uh, implemented during these years, maybe the last one, which is the implementation of telemedicine of e-health program, uh, which has been agreed upon between the government of Slovenia and government of uh, Cap Verde, which uh, it reflects actually the actual needs of Cap Verde uh, by providing necessary equipment to 10 selected hospitals countrywide, thus covering nine inhabited, uh, all nine inhabited uh, islands by training and maintaining the network in order to ensure the integration and sustainability of the implemented program. Let me end with this, that I believe that there is ground uh, prepared uh, also between the UN agencies and other uh, agencies and organizations worldwide, not to double uh, or even overlap the effort, but to work uh, uh, complementary and in cooperation. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias. Le doy la palabra. Thank you very much. Let me give the floor to the distinguished representative of Nigeria, uh, asking his excuses, but he must be very brief. Thank you very much, Chairman. I shall certainly be very brief. Uh, let me, first of all, on behalf of my delegation, commend His Excellency the Secretary General for uh, convening this meeting and opening it, and also the distinguished panelists, particularly uh, Madame uh, Ogata and the uh, former Prime Minister of Thailand, His Excellency Surin Pitswan. I also wish to thank the rest of the panelists and yourself included, Chairperson. Uh, human security is at the core of the United Nations global uh, activities, undoubtedly. It involves not only freedom from fear and want, but also a sense of secure future in peace and happiness, and the prospect of continued gainful employment and possible prosperity for all. In this sense, we welcome the multisectoral approach that has been proposed by the panelists and lead speakers. We believe that human security should be at the core of the global development agenda and an essential ingredient of the global human rights agenda as well. 
We may speak of all types of human rights, but absenting such rights as the right to housing, education, decent job, food, access to medicines, nutrition, and related rights that make life not only wholesome but worthwhile will indeed compromise any gains that might be made in advancing the promotion and protection of human rights. Achieving human security must also be a central aspect of the UN's peace and security initiatives and conflict resolution actions, especially in Africa. We therefore welcome the statement by uh, Ambassador Tete on behalf of the Commissioner for Peace and Security of the African Union. Also, Chairperson, incorporating human security issues in the MDGs and their continued integration into the SDGs and post-2015 development agenda is highly desir desirable and necessary. I thank you, sir. Check it out. Thank you very much. To conclude, I would like to give the floor very briefly to the panelists if they would like to make a very short comments. But this does not appear to be the case. Allow me then to conclude this session recalling something that Ambassador Flores brought up. Human security is the broadest reflection of solidarity. And on that note, I close this part of the session. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman and dear friends. I feel slightly deserted and alone here up <laughs> on the podium, but I'm sure that uh, we all have a sense of common purpose uh, and aspirations today. I, I wish I had been here all day, because I just came back from the Somalia conference in London, uh, so I missed this discussion, which I would have enjoyed very much. I only had listened to the last 10, 15 minutes and that will lead me to some excursions from my formal speech later on. But first of all, I want to recognize so many friends. This is, uh, when I looked around the room, I, I, I see friends and colleagues I've worked with through the years, uh, Sarah Kogata and of course Sorin, Piz Sorin Pizzewan, Sonia Picado, my friend from the Swedish government, Carl Tam, and uh, uh, of course, uh, the, the, uh, the uh, UN, our UN special, uh, advice, special advisor on human security, Yuki Takaso, and I probably missed a couple of other friends whom I haven't reached because I'm nearsighted. But it's really great to be with you, and thank you for all your efforts. Um, uh, I have followed uh, the issue of uh, human security for some time, uh, most concretely since... Uh, 2005, when I was five and six, when I was president of the UN General Assembly, as some of you may recall. And um, that was, in fact, the first time uh, human security was brought into a formal document of the United Nations, the summit outcome document. And uh, I can tell you it was not uncontroversial, and I'm sure you have in your discussion reflected the different aspects of that. Uh, the basic the basic view was that we had to avoid that this does not become, as one of you said in the end here, a rhetorical concept alone. 
but that we should be reminded in today's world that in the end it is the results on the ground, it is what happens to people in the field, in this world, which is really, that's where our work is counted in the end. And maybe it's, it's a useful reminder that sometimes we come to the conclusion that international security and even national security in the end should lead to human security. Uh, I think this basic reminder was the reason why it was put in, rather, rather discreetly and, and only to look further into this idea. And since I was part of those who decided to put it in, I remember now how we were thinking, namely that we need to remind it that we have certain things that guide us, and I, al I always have one thing in my pocket that helps me, the Charter of the United Nations. <laughs> but I always say it's not only the Charter, in the end it's also the child out there, or the woman, or the oppressed, or the victims. That's what we are here for. And that's why it entered that document. And questions were asked, how will this be related to our very disciplined work in the different organs of the General Assembly and the Security Council and ECOSOC and so forth. But that is what you now have done. You have discussed this through the, through the years and come to conclusions of the validity of the, of the term. So now I go back to my former remarks, prepared in advance. Uh, the formula that was uh, adopted, which was the most important in the 2005 document, was the formula, there is no peace without development, there is no development without peace, and there is no lasting peace or sustainable development without respect of human rights. And I would say since then I have become even more convinced that peace development as well as human rights and the rule of law are interlinked and mutually reinforcing. Action in these areas in parallel is essential to, last, to lasting security, progress and people's well-being. I would say, I would go as far as to say that if one of these pillars is weak, the whole structure is weak. If there is no peace, there is no development. If there is no development without peace. And if it is not respect of human rights and rule of law, the structure is also weak. So in, in other words, we have to work simultaneously on all three. I remember a debate in the 70s where the formula was first peace, then development, and then we may have human rights. That is not the way we have to work. It has to be done work in parallel in order to keep that structure strong. In 2008, the General Assembly reaffirmed the potential of human security in responding to current and emerging threats. The Secretary General's report two years later triggered a discussion on human security and led to a report with the views of member states. All this helped to generate the milestone General Assembly resolution last October that recognized a common understanding of human security. It fulfilled, in, in fact, the pledge that we made in the 2005 World Summit to look into what this term is meaning. And here, of course, the the Commission on Human Rights and on Human Security and their contributions played an extremely important role. And I would like to thank everyone who has been involved in this long, hard and finally successful process. It proved that a firm commitment to the principles of the UN and the centrality of human dignity can indeed achieve results. And I come back to this point made that it must not just be a rhetorical term, it, it must have concrete uh, a concrete translation and should be a guiding star, a guiding rem reminder of the need to put the human being in the center. And therefore I'm grateful to the UN Trust Fund for human security, especially its advisory board and its donors. And by the way, let me also thank uh, the Ambassador Schill and his network here to keep the issues alive. But this board has, and this fund has supported more than 200 projects in some 80 countries and they cover this wide range of issues across the UN agenda, uh, which are related to human security, uh, climate change, peace building, urban violence, poverty, migration, and health. And this in itself shows the comprehensive and interdisciplinary nature of the work of human security. And I think we should accept that is the way it is. 
And you have now adopted this approach that I think is a, going to be more and more an operational approach and connect the, the, these principles, these guiding values into concrete work and constantly remind us of the need to put the result out in the field in the center of our attention. And I guess we have learned a number of lessons. On the fund, we should strengthen it and broaden its financial support. And this fund is not the only resource available to advance human security, but it's one of the most substantial. So now is the time to build on the progress, draw conclusions from the projects and exchange ideas among human security practitioners, as you have done uh, here today. Um, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, uh, as stated before, the concept of human security is founded on an understanding of the connection between peace development and human rights. It advances solutions and answers to real needs. It involves global and national authorities and institutions as well as grassroots groups and communities. Everyone benefits. Uh, the Secretary General and I are working to integrate our work on the main pillars of the United Nations. And this is the best way to improve our effectiveness as it is an indispensable way to address the huge multidimensional cross-cutting challenges we face today. And partnerships are key to success. Our aim is to bring together all interested organizations, groups, individuals to create a world where people enjoy peace development and human dignity. This is my first formal re meeting on human security for some time, but I deal with this issue every day, directly or indirectly. When I visit Syrian refugees, which I did in December in Beirut, when I advocate for water and toilets for all people, which I did in Africa and Asia recently in different places, when I take a stand to end violence against women, which I did in the lobby of the United Nations a month ago, uh, I participate in the work for human security. I'm just one of many who have seen the value of integrating efforts and working together with this human security notion in the back of my head practically always. And as an envoy dealing with several conflict situations, I realized that peace would never take root in fragile and insecure conditions. As the emergency relief coordinator, when I worked together with Sadako Gata, I understood that humanitarian aid could only go so far in restoring normalcy. As Deputy Secretary General, I appreciate even more that we have to pull together all the knowledge, all the expertise, and all the energy of the United Nations and outside in order to reach common goals, above all to improve the lives for the millions and millions of people we are here to serve. And I count on all of you to build on the success of today's event by advancing the human security approach when we work to create a better future for all. And with this, I thank you. Uh, and I don't think, I don't know whether I'm authorized to close the meeting. Will I be given that very high responsibility? I'm honored and I thank you very much for your attention and wish you good, good work ahead. And, uh, and thank you again for all the efforts you have made in this issue. Thank you. Check it out.